so we'll just do your introductory statements and uh, we'll just go left to right. So we'll start with Laura. Laura Woody, Scottish Green. Can I just check this is working? Does it need to be switched on? That is purely to pick up for the camera. Oh, perfect. Great. Excellent. Can everybody hear me okay at the back? I'll do my best to project, but just wave if you can't hear me. Um, I'm Laura Moody. I'm here to represent the Scottish Green Party. Um, I live in Galloway, actually, so I've come up here today from Kukubri um, in my very aged electric car. <laughs> it's quite, thankfully, not an eventful journey, but uh, quite a long one. Um, and... Uh, I am currently uh, not an elected representative, but I'm here on behalf of the Greens because sadly our Kirsten, who's the councillor in South Lanarkshire, couldn't make it this evening. Um, but she would have loved to be here and I'm sure you'll be seeing her throughout the week. I know she's keen that I mention the 20 mile per hour position the South Lanarkshire branch are currently running um, and she's working really hard on that. Um, I'm, I'm here, I stood uh, for election in the South Scotland region um, in 2021 and missed out on getting elected but I've kept active and involved locally and I really care about the South of Scotland and the potential there is here to make real inroads into the climate crisis. Where I live in Dumfries and Galloway is pre predominantly rural, lots of agriculture, lots of coast, but also lots of forestry and there's lots of opportunities that we have here to make a big difference to climate change with really quite small changes. So we're looking at things like infrastructure, transport is, Scot is Scotland's biggest contributor to emissions and yet I'm sure you'll find it as familiar here as I do in rural Galloway. Incredibly hard to get reliable public transport to get you places. Um, that can be changed. That can be invested in. We can have affordable, reliable public transport, even in rural communities. It just needs the political will to make the difference. Um, it's fantastic being here tonight. I've been discussing... Um, I used to work for a project called Mid Steeple Quarter in Dumfries, and that's a project that's taking... Um, empty buildings in the centre of Dumfries High Street and buying them for the community and redeveloping them, making them into community shops, community owned businesses, getting there at affordable rents and crucially looking at the floors above to address housing need and to redevelop those houses into warm, efficient, affordable homes so that people come back and live in our town centres again and bring life and vibrancy and also crucially make those buildings energy efficient because the other area Scotland is really struggling with in terms of climate and addressing the climate emergency is home heating and we really need to address that problem urgently and that will improve all our lives it will make our homes warmer it will make them more comfortable it will make them more affordable to run so it's a bit of a no-brainer Patrick Harvey's currently working on it hard in Parliament to improve our building, heat and building standards. And that's the kind of difference having a green in the room can make, that they can prioritise those issues, they can look at practical solutions and focus on communities. Thank you, yeah, thank you. And same again, if you can't hear me, just say, or if I'm taking too long, just cut me off. I've not prepared an, prepared an introduction, so just bear with me. Uh, my name is Ross Clark. I'm the SNP councillor for Lark Hall. Uh, I'm also the SNP spokesperson for climate change and sustainability on South Lancashire Council. For me, climate change is one of the, apart from some of the obvious, it's one of the issues that, that got me into politics. Uh, when I was in, in school, I think the, all the, the school strikes around the world were, were happening, and I thought to myself, uh, I want to be a part of this change that is happening. There's no point in having all these policies and all these other things if we're not going to have a planet to implement them. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly important for myself and for many other young people that we take action, urgent action, that we push governments, regardless of what party might be in power, to do more on it. Uh, and local authorities as well. Uh, I've seen some of the great work of the uh, the Youth Forum on Climate Change in South Lanarkshire. Uh, I was at one of their events uh, last year, I think it was, uh, in the way they are engaging more young people in schools and adults as well to get interested and educated about climate change. Because one, one of the barriers to progress is that not everyone knows the details or knows how to convey 
the different aspects of climate change and the urgency, the, the importance uh, that we do take urgent action, uh, and they do some fantastic work, and it's important that we empower them as well, because uh, it's not just a single issue. We need to take a holistic approach to climate change that's connected to so many things that you might not think initially. There's connected to health, your energy bills, uh, so these are the sort of things we need to convey, and obviously fighting some climate disinformation or climate denial. But through my work in the council only elected a year ago, uh, I've seen the difference that people like us can make and the importance, that, the importance on us being held to account on. I actually worked with uh, the Green Councillor, Kirsten Robb, and uh, there was input from the Labour group as well, which was appreciated on, uh, on a motion to increase our energy efficiency in our council buildings and new builds and so on. So uh, these are some very important issues and there's lots that we have done, but lots more that we can do. Thank you. Hope that wasn't too long. That was two minutes 57. So. Great, great time. Oh, on, <laughs> well, no pressure then. Oh, that's heavier than it, than it looks. Um, I don't want to oh, crash the water. So next up we've got... I hope you've not hit go yet. <laughs> thank you very much, Les, and thank you for the invitation. It's great to be on the panel tonight with Laura, Ross and Brian and Robert because we do need to have a cross-party approach to tackle the climate and nature emergency. It needs to be cross-government, it needs to be all levels of government and it needs to be all of you. So it's great to be here in um, the Straven Climate Hub. I've been going about just looking at things and taking photos and I need to get some of that eco-friendly dog shampoo. That definitely <laughs> caught my eye. I've got a, a big Labrador at home who would uh, benefit from that. But tonight we will touch on themes that are very global in nature, um, you know, the climate and nature emergency is the biggest threat, you know, to, to the planet, to humanity. But the way we are going to tackle it is through local action and every single person can make a difference. I've spent uh, today, my first visit today was at a school in North Lanarkshire. I'm currently um, in the middle of a, an eco tour of the schools in, in my parliamentary region, which is central Scotland. So I represent people in Falkirk, in North Lanarkshire, and a big part of South Lanarkshire, sadly not Straven, but uh, Hamilton, Lark, Colstone House, and East Kilbride. So very close to here. And the eco tour. Um, is promoting a, a global campaign to stop ecocide and trying to explain ecocide to very young children. It's a word they don't know, but the minute you get in the room, they know exactly what you're talking about. They've seen the wildfires on the news, they've seen the, the floods and extreme weather events, they've seen oil leaks in our oceans, they've seen what plastic pollution is doing, they know about poor air quality and they know that we need a just transition because we can't keep doing what we're doing with fossil fuels. They know that proposals like the, the licensing of the, the Rosebank oil field, for example, would be absolute climate madness. If that is allowed to go ahead, we're going to do the same thing over and over for the next 25 years. So we need to get that shift in investment into a just transition. Um, driving from Hamilton tonight, uh, again, in the electric car, better say that. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's, it's better than other options that were available. And, um, you know, you could see loads of turbines in the way here recently as part of the Scottish Parliament's Net Zero um, Energy Transport committee we were on a trip to, to White Lee Wind Farm so we see the opportunity we see the investment but we need to make sure that local people and communities benefit from that I think the Scottish Government's community wealth building agenda will help I think um, circular economy bill is exciting so we'll touch on some of that tonight but I think I've got five <coughs> seconds left so again just thank you for having me and I look forward to your questions I love this one Oh, you got your own? I've got my own one. <laughs> it's a green one as well. Oh! <laughs> so, next up, we've got Brian Whistle, who's the Scottish Conservative 
MSP for South Scotland? I am. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, lovely to be here. I'm usually in the Weavers, to be fair. <laughs> but it's, uh, so I walk, I walk past to go to the Weavers. Uh, but um, no, my, I'm a Shadow uh, Minister for um, Environment, Biodiversity, Land Reform. Um, as Monica said, it, it, and as been said by the rest of the panel, climate change is the biggest thing that, that's uh, affecting us globally at the moment, and actually. Uh, that we have, we, what I think we are, we're very, very good at setting targets. We have world-leading targets in this country, and uh, we don't have a route map to get there. Uh, and I think we are. I want to be as we want the practicality. We want to be pragmatic. We need to understand what a just transition means. We need to understand what net zero means, which is a, a, another interesting question. I have yet to have somebody to uh, two people in a row to tell me exactly what net zero means. But um, we have a lot of really, really great uh, policies. We've got a lot of really great targets, and uh, we're missing the targets consistently. And our commitment to keeping 1.5 alive. For me, this is about, it's not about what everybody else is doing in the world. It's about what Scotland's doing. Can we stick to our targets? Can we hit our targets? Because if we don't hit our targets, how can we expect everybody else to hit their targets? And it's, and of course, it, it, it's, it's not just about this, the whole of Scotland. Then it's about regions. Then it's about individuals. What can we do as individuals um, to impact uh, the, the planet? Um, I would love to drive an electric car. I have tried very hard to get myself into an electric car, but I am a South of Scotland uh, MSP, and currently the system would not allow me really to safely drive an electric car around the whole of my region. Um, I have tried really hard to look at it. I've looked at you know where where the car charging points are. Big fan of of uh, the development of hydrogen, especially in heavy goods vehicles and heavy industry. Again, we talk a great game uh, in this country. We have all the tools to do that. We have all the natural resource to be world leaders in development of green hydrogen, yet we're way behind the curve. So we need to, st we need to stop telling everybody else what to do. We need to start stepping up ourselves. We need to look at what our own uh, climate change ambitions are, and we need to live up to them. And, sh and we, could, we could show the rest of the world how to do this, but currently, uh, I think we're falling way short. I say I get into this quite a long time. I don't know if you remember Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. Uh, I used to brought Al Gore across I had an event management company and brought Al Gore across here in the early 2000s. And that's really when I got into this, when I was quite taken, apart from the fact he flew over on a private jet, um, <laughs> I was quite taken with what he had to say. So uh, the, 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 it's, this has been a long time coming and we're way behind the curve. So I'll leave it there. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And lastly, we've got Robert Brown, who's the Liberal 10 MSP, or Councillor, sorry, for the Promoting Service. <laughs> I was an MSP before, but I'm a councillor now, and I represent uh, Rotherham South, and I'm chair of the, of the um, Communities Enterprise Committee on the Council, which is my role in this particular matter. Thank you very much for the opportunity to take part in this uh, debate tonight, and also, frankly, to see your, your premises here, which I'd heard about, but hadn't had the opportunity to visit. Um, I do think this whole issue is clouded by overlapping strategies and action plans. They're all worthy in their own right, but to be quite honest, they suck an enormous amount of official time and effort in producing paper and reports, and all with nice ticks beside them, but sometimes it doesn't always lead to the action that needs to move things on. The key areas for attack are transport, domestic and commercial energy, um, biodiversity, renewable energies. And I like to see practical action. The old slogan of think global and act local seems to me to be the core approach we should be taking towards this matter. In Scotland, as Brian, I think, rightly said earlier on, we've got admirable targets, but we've got significant gaps in actually how we're going to hit them. And progress has been a little bit camouflaged by the, the COVID epidemic, which um, knocked back, obviously, car use and energy use of various other kinds, um, but was an artificial knockback, gave us perhaps a little bit of a breathing space, but that's about it. For example, in greenhouse gas emissions, the next key target is the 75% reduction by 2030. That was put into law largely due to the efforts of the Liberal Democrats to wanted staging posts on the way to the, the end targets, if you like. Um, but these, the target already looks dodgy. Or as the Climate Change Committee put it, there are particular concerns about the achievement of the 2030 goal due to glaring gaps in the Scottish Government's climate plan. Now, that's not a criticism of the Scottish Government in that regard, but it's, it, it is the issue of the gap between the plans and the reality. 
Um, there's major funding gaps as well on everything from EVG charging points, which again Brian touched on, to heat in buildings and retrofit, not least, to support for public transport and active travel. Now these things don't exist in isolation, and one of the interesting things about joining communities and enterprise together in my committee is you get a bit of a chance to see some of the things that are going on. And a successful strategy to divide, to, to um, tackle ch climate change doesn't exist in isolation. It draws on the innovation and the developing technologies of local companies the exploitation of ideas from colleges and universities, and it sees energy policy as part of our drive to cut energy prices and energy use. I think Monica touched on that and reduce food poverty. For example, if South Lanarkshire firms can't only fill their supply chains from China or Turkey, then frankly we've got work to do. If there's not enough mechanics who know how to service electric cars, that's a drag on progress to net zero as well. If the national grid can't cope with the demand made on it by new technology, then it's time for major investment in the national grid as well, and perhaps in more localised storage and distribution uh, systems um, at, at as well. And for that matter, if our supply chains, our technological and research collaboration with Europe are disrupted by Brexit, then we're on the wrong track in that particular regard as well. Now, we've had a part to play as Liberal Democrats in this. We were instrumental in setting up the Climate Change Committee in the last council, which has given a bit of focus to the um, work of the, of the South Lancashire Council on the matter. We had a motion on um, the use of weed killers, we're looking at the biodiversity issue. And I'll, I'll finish just by simply saying that climate change is too important to fail or lag. Councils and communities can't, can deliver the goods, but we need the funding and the tools to be able to do the job. Thank you very much. Uh, so now open the questions up to the board. So has anybody got a question? Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know the each of the panelists' views on the expansion of oil rigs in the Rock Sea. Okay, does anybody want to say that first? I'd like to hear what they want. It needs to be stopped, uh, and, and urgently. Um, it's ludicrous having targets to reduce emissions and to retrofit homes and all, all the rest, of the, every, everything on our to-do list that we'd like to do, if we are continuing to expand the extraction of fossil fuels, we have to stop. Um, and, and the easiest, it's, it, this is the low-hanging fruit, fruit, this is the easy bit, stop doing more of the bad stuff, it should be the simple decisions to make. And yet, yet again, we're failing at that very first, very most basic hurdle. And all we're doing is storing up problems for ourselves for the future and horrendous problems for the global south, which of course is the area that's most badly affected. We're seeing climate change here. Now it's having an impact on our lives. It's much worse elsewhere. And we have to, to speak on this matter with any kind of authority, we have to take those really basic steps. No more oil and gas fields. Ross? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We can't keep uh, unlimitedly extracting oil and gas. As was said, we can't keep doing more of the bad stuff. It's there's no point in all this, all these policies if we're going to if we're going to keep doing that. Obviously, we can immediately switch off the the tap for want of a, a better expression tomorrow. But as soon as we can, we should definitely, uh, definitely stop extracting oil and gas, and focus more on renewable, of course, which is the the future. We're not going to reach. Uh, net zero by 2045 if we keep doing what's stopping us from doing that, if that makes sense. But I would largely agree with what, what's been said. Okay. Monica, can you move that microphone over? Thank you. Well, I think I answered the question before it was asked, Eric, because I did mention in my opening remarks that, um, you know, we've got current, these are not abstract conversations, you know, imminently as we speak, someone in a UK government department is looking at Rose Bank and making a, a decision about whether or not that should be allowed to go ahead. So that whole licensing regime is, is, is reserved to the UK government. Um, but I did write to Hamza Youssef, our new First Minister, ahead of his meeting with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, to say, when you're down there, you have to raise this. Um, the decision doesn't sit with the Scottish Government, and I think we all would accept that. But as a, a, a 
a government, a devolved government, you know, there is there is soft power there, there is a, a, a voice. Um, if it goes ahead, I think we need to find ways to frustrate it from happening. Um, you know, whether we could use the, the planning system to try and delay or, or, or prevent any um, onshore development that would be required um, around that. But basically, if we allow something like Rosebank to go ahead uh, or, or Campbell or Jack or any of these proposals, that is a deliberate act of ecocides. That's what I'm trying to bring in legislation to stop. And it's not because, you know, we're saying, you know, turn off the taps tomorrow. Um, going back to that point about a just transition, we've known about this for decades. We know we have to make this shift in investment and we need to put that and that investment and focus into the workers and the communities in the North East, but including in places like Grangemouth and in my region, and to make sure that we start to lead and provide climate leadership, because you can bring in all the world leaders and private jets that you want, but unless the Scottish Government and the UK Government provide leadership, because what we're seeing right now, I'm afraid, is a lot of climate hypocrisy. You know, we can do loss and damage of £2 million, we can talk about climate justice, but it adds up to greenwashing if we allow um, projects like Rosebank to go ahead. Um, now, of course, we need energy security and we need to have that resilience, but we have the solutions, we just need to put it into practice. And it, it needs all of us, whether we're elected or not, regardless of party, to put that pressure on ministers in Scotland, but also the UK government, and Brian's got pals down there. So that would be my appeal to Brian before I pass the mic. <laughs> Is that you? You must know, Rishi. You must know him. <laughs> um, let, let's start where we all agree. We need to stop uh, burning fossil fuels as quickly as we possibly can. But I will tell you, but one thing you have to remember, it's not just about fossil fuels, it's about the petrochemical industry as well. And we will continue to use petrochemicals for decades to come. We need a just transition, so we need to move away uh, from fossil fuels. What we don't want to get to a stage, though, is where we cut um, uh, our, our, the North Sea off and then have to import. We cannot get to that stage. Look at the state that Germany have got themselves into because they import so much from uh, Russia. So in that respect, I, I'm not, at, at the moment I haven't got, a, a, uh, my mind's not made up whether we should or we shouldn't. What I do need to know, what I do need to understand is whether or not by not uh, allowing any further uh, oil to come out of the oil uh, uh, North Sea, what that situation puts us in, in terms of uh, your homes, uh, heating your homes, in terms of um, movement and transport, um, in terms of um, moving around the country. If we, if we decide, if we cut that off, if we don't do the transition justly, remembering that the biggest investors in uh, renewable energy are the oil and gas industry. They are the biggest investors. If they don't invest in it, it means somebody else has got to do it. We have to find the money from somewhere else. So rather than vilify those, what we need to do is work with them, incentivise the oil and gas industry to move faster away from, from oil and gas, because they're the ones that have the solutions. They've known, they've known about this for decades that this was coming. I mean, my, la my last, um, uh, my last uh, job, I, had a, I was a director of an event management company. I was in the, the, um, the offices of Shell, and while I was sitting, uh, waiting for, for my meeting, there was a, there was a, a, a plaque up in the wall from a, um, the sort of global conference, and the vice president said, it was a quote that says, if, you, if there's no resistance to change, then the change is not challenging enough. And you're talking now late 1990s. Um, this chap had got up at the global Shell conference and said that his vision was that Shell would be the number one producers of renewable energy within 50 years. So work with them. Don't work against them and be pragmatic about it. If we're going to, if we're going to cut our oil and gas, stop using oil and gas. That's individuals. Stop, if you stop using the product, there'll be no need for it. But we cannot get to a situation where we cut off our own supply locally and then have to import it from, uh, from outside. We cannot get to that situation. Do that over? Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I think I'd like to focus on transition, if I may, because it, that seems to be the core thing that arises out of that. Actually, very simple, but very complicated question. And it seems to me, I talked earlier on about some of the, the companies I'd visited in South Lanarkshire that were doing things with electric vehicles, with um, um, you, know, you sell things with battery storage, with a variety of other things. The colleges and the universities have got experimental things. South Lanarkshire College, for example, has got an experimental house, which they use to train the architects and the, um, and, and the people in the building industry, you know, who are doing these kind of things. Now, these, frankly, are the, are the tools with which we will make the transition easier. Because at the end of the day, an awful lot of people in Scotland are dependent on gas supplies, non-renewable supplies for their heating and for their light and so forth in their houses. Now, that's got to be able to change. And in amongst that, there's an awful lot of people who are in fuel poverty as well, who would find, uh, who are, are finding and will continue to find the increases in energy prices very damaging. Now, you've got to take the public with you on these sort of things. And I think, in fact, one of the big advantages of renewable energies is the fact that there's some potential for stability longer term, both in the supply and in the actual cost of producing the thing. And I think that's quite an important aspect of what we, what we do here. Brian's quite right, I think, about the points that he's made about um, the need to um, involve the oil companies and then the gas companies in taking this one forward because they are big investors in this area. They have the technology and the technology is going to be key to make the difference here. But we can't just allow them to do it to their own timetable. This has got to be something which government has a big impact in setting the standards and intervening in what they're doing to try and get them along the road rather quicker. Finally, I'll just comment, if I may, on the fact that Monica, I think, has invented a new language of uh, ecocide and greenwashing and various other things like that. Uh, maybe that's a side product of the thing as well. But this, is, I think, is probably the most important question to be asked tonight. It's the only one so far, right? Okay, uh, next question. Uh, it's not a question, it's just a point that uh, mm. in the first quarter of this year, uh, renewable energy has generated more electricity than any other source. It's on its way. Yeah. It just needs to it is. Mm -hmm. I, had a look, I had a wee look today, by the way, to see where all the energy from the south of Scotland came from. Because there's, there's an app, you can check it. And 65% of it came from renewable energy. 30% came from nuclear. Here's a thought for you. Well, one other point. Don't we already <coughs> import gas to the in a liquefied form to the south of England? In fact, is it, is it Wales? Yeah. Uh, and I think that comes from Qatar. So we, also, we already import. We import gas fossil from we all import uh, fossil fuels from the USA, and this this is what re it's, this it's called offshoring the problem. Yeah. We import fracked gas from the United States. So if you're against fracking, for goodness sake, don't import it either. Don't offshore the problem. You got to you got that's what I'm saying. You have to deal with the issue in Scotland. Deal with us first. Okay. Another question. Can I ask? How many members of the panel actually have a scientific background? Brian's <laughs> a jack of all trades. I was in, I was in, Olympic I, medalist as well, aren't you, Brian? I, I was, uh, <laughs> He's very modest. <laughs> well, do, you, do you want to go the other way? Because I, I think I, I started every time. <laughs> well, it's, 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 probably well, the, I'm a it's probably not the sort of thing to. <laughs> Be uh, it's, probably, yes or no. it's probably not the sort of thing to admit in, um, in answer to that question. I was a lawyer by profession. Probably doesn't quite fit into what you're, you're looking for there. So um, I, I can't, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. What I would say, though, is an awful lot of what's um, gone in motion was begun by Jim Wallace and Ross Finney as ministers in the uh, Scottish Government sometime who, who began a lot of the solar panel and wind farm sort of stuff back in the 1999 um, Parliament onwards. So, you know, it takes an awful long time sometimes to get these things through in the sufficient quantities and quality that we need to have. Uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, I was an industrial chemist. My, my profession was industrial chemist. And uh, I, I find it, I find it now after all these years really useful in doing what I'm doing now. There you go. No, uh, not a scientist. Uh, I am an urban planner before I became a, a politician. Uh, so my degree is in environmental planning. A long uh, time ago, I think the the climate science is very clear and consistent. I think you know across the world. There is, you know, um, you know, broad consensus on the science. I don't think the problem here is the science and what the science tells us. It's the, it's the, the, the implementation of, of policy and, you know, meeting 
obligations that have been set in law and the targets that have been mentioned. So where I would disagree with Brian about the need to be pragmatic and um, you know be gentle with you know Shell and, and the big didn't oil and say, gas companies. Then say gentle. You know, well, <laughs> pragmatic. I think we do we do need to be bold. You know, if your if your house was in fire, Brian, you would be pragmatic about it. So the planet is burning. We need to be bold. Treat it like the emergency that it is. Um, but it should never be you know people that that pay the price of that. It should never be you know, workers that pay the price of that. But it doesn't need to be, you know, these oil and gas companies are making record breaking profits into the millions. So don't feel sorry for these guys. They're not the ones in poverty. We are paying seventy five percent We've come market. through well we I know but we've come through COVID, we're in a post eleven crisis. Poverty is on the increase, including in communities like Strave and I see also you've got Susan Kerr tonight, one of your local councillors in the area. But we've got you know, a record number of billionaires in Britain. So there are people with very deep pockets who can fund and finance some of these solutions and that's who we need to be um, turning our attention um, to. So, um, Keep looking at me more. <laughs> that's a nice thing you've got on. But no, um, Shell and all these companies, they can, they can afford to, to do more. And you said yourself, they've known for decades what's, what's coming. Awesome. Yeah, so not specifically in uh, Climate change. I do. I did sport coaching at university, so I've got some background in sports science a wee bit, uh, which sort of ties into the active travel side. So I can claim a wee bit of a uh, connection. <laughs> but different. I'm always willing to to learn more. Uh, I took part in some uh, climate training that the council ran for. I think they got in. It might be Keep Scotland Beautiful. I could be wrong. Uh, we did some climate training for councillors, so te and I passed it, so technically I'm climate literate. <laughs> uh, I've got a certificate online that I can I can show you. Uh, because I think it's important that we you know admit we we don't have all the answers and we're not all uh, experts. It's important we listen to the scientists, important we listen to you guys and people in the community about what action we need to take. Uh, and make sure we're, you know, doing meaningful engagement, and that we are as informed as we can be. Uh, so I'll take a a, a wee a tiny wee bit of a background. <laughs> I thought we'd all had enough of experts, so we're all moving on. I, I think it's a really good question though, because I, I think what it exposes is the reality that this is such a huge issue and such a challenge for humanity that it's going to take a huge range of skills to to tackle it. It's not just the scientists, boffins, that are going to sit in a, in a lab and come up with some magical solution, although this, that's the part of it. It's everybody doing everything that they can. So, yeah, I don't have a science background. I've done bits of construction. I've done bricklaying, insulating. My dad's a sparky, so I've done bits of electrics. They're all climate skills. Planning is a climate skill. If we had climate-educated planners on all of our, our councils, if we had ecologists on all of our councils, that would give us a huge step towards tackling the climate emergencies in, in the local communities. We need botanists, we need traditional scientists, but we also need community development workers. We need people who can bring people together. We need educators who can share knowledge and, and help people to understand the science. We need litter pickers, we need cleaners, you know, literally, you name it, there are so many skills that we need to make the most of to capture, to tackle this emergency. Science is one of them, but it's not the only one. Okay, uh, Gary? No, I was uh, asking Glassford, and it uh, was just the point you were making about the expertise of the panels and things. Because in Glassford, a few years ago, there were some trees which were about uh, two metres in diameter, which were cut down for the sake of widening a road by a metre for the sake of housing. Um, yeah, I was at primary school there and we thought he walked through the school, what the hell where the trees going? They don't they don't see the value of that to rural people. Uh, but that was SNP at the time and I said I'll never let vote SNP again so because of that. So I've said you so much. So so there is no I d I don't see why would things filter down from the you know, the government officials down into planning departments and councils and things because there seems to be a disconnection somewhere. Uh, so the the theory theory mentioned of the people. I don't mean to be facetious. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, uh, 
I'm just a bush lord right there, so. No, I mean, I think it's fair point, and I think if you mentioned planning, so I think that's an important factor to take into account in both how you count for some of the things that, that companies are trying to do and how you deal with uh, the, the environment and, and looking at planning issues. Yeah, so I, I sit on the planning committee and the, the council uh, and much of the sins we make are kind of bound by the, the policy and national planning frameworks that needs to be you know, material planning concerns yeah. that, that inform our decisions. But I think you've raised an absolutely good point. I think we all recognise we need more housing and more social and affordable housing, but we need to protect our green space. Uh, and I think more work does need to be done so that it is protected uh, and we aren't loose. I don't know about the, the specific case you uh, raised, but I think you do raise an important point in that. Uh, and we need to get a, a balance to things. Because I did some PhDs uh, and so on on this in, in university, and the benefit to people of green space, uh, not even just to the environment, but to people's mental health. Uh, you know, encourage them to get active, and it also it just it looks nice as well. Yeah. Uh, if it's well maintained, of course. Surely, people are buying a new house would like to be around nature and the trees that are there rather than. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, it's, it's just, there's no holistic thought in anything. So many money. I honestly think quite often when you see a new housing scheme, they have terribly bucolic names like. Meadow Walk and uh, and, and Pipistrelle Way, and I always think whenever I hear it, I always think so. That's that's what was destroyed to build to build that street because they're often named after whatever was a precious habitat that was there before they were built. But people need homes, so you know we need to build homes for people. But we need to be smarter about how we go about doing that. The national planning framework has recently been reviewed um, since the Greens came into government um, earlier this year. So there are a number of applications going through the works just now all over Scotland where I think communities who have campaigned against things because they're, they're hoping the new national planning framework will support them because it has stronger protections for biodiversity and for the environment to see whether that actually works in practice because ultimately planning decisions are still generally made by local councils so it'll be interesting to see how that beds in and the impact it makes but the national planning policy now has much stronger protections for environmental areas for biodiversity, much more consideration for the importance of renewables. So there's, we're hoping it's going to make a difference. We don't know until we see the impact on the ground. But because it's a new policy nationally, all the local councils should soon be consulting on their own local plans to make sure it aligns properly with it. And that was a big element. I think Robert talked earlier about plans and targets and checklists. One of the big problems we have is quite often all these different plans and targets and checklists yeah. don't meet up yeah. and we need to get much better at synthesising all of that, making sure it all makes sense together and it's all pulling in the same direction. Monica? It's a great uh, question from Gary from Glassford and as a planner on the panel, although it's been a while since I've been working in, in that area, but um, for itching to say something because, you know, this is really kind of a very basic, what we used to call development management and planning. And colleagues are right, you know, there's a national planning framework before, there's loads of government policy that filters down to, to, to local plans and local policy. But you're right, there is this disconnect between once an actual planning application lands on someone's desk yeah. and you've got to look at the layout and the density and all the other factors. <coughs> so I think part of the issue, Gary, is that we have had local government hauled out for want of a better phrase because those experts that you need in your community you know working in, in this area in South Lanarkshire more widely the people who can look at a, a key survey when it comes in or look at the biodiversity and ecology you know we, we ask um, developers to do lots of surveys like a bat survey for example um, there should be a presumption in favour of protecting and, and saving the trees uh, and vegetation that we do have, unless there's a really good sort of safety issue. But what's happening now, and it goes back to when industry get to uh, mark their own homework or they give them too much flexibility, that they can afford to pay for consultants to do surveys. And then councils either have to say, well, have we got the expertise in-house? 
Yeah. More often than not, they, they don't, and if you're in a small, we're a, we're a big council, South Lanarkshire, but if you're a really small council, you don't have that expertise, yeah. are you going to put out the tender and, and ask consultants? So you don't, and then the developers who generally make 20, 25% profit on a sort of standard new build, they want to do the cheapest and easiest thing, and if that is, we want a, a road that goes that way, these trees are in the way, then they will. And councillor, um, councillors and council planners are often, you know, watching the clock under pressure. So, so there's a culture there. But what I would say, because I know, um, you know, uh, the Greens in government maybe say that they're achieving a lot. But what's been quite disappointing, I have to say, someone who sat on the Parliament Committee dealing with the, the planning bill, which was passed a few years ago, um, and one of your former colleagues, Andy Whiteman, um, it was a very unusual uh, trio. It was me, Andy White from the Greens, and Graham Simpson, the, the, the yeah. Conservative member. Top but we tried to amend that, <laughs> that bill in many ways. But one of the things the Tories let me down on this one was we need to equalise the planning system. And right now, developers can put in appeals and get a second chance and get the best lawyers and throw money at it and go for a judicial review. And the communities often have like, no other... Um, Avenue, there's no checks and balances, so we've tried to get the system more equal. Now that they're in government, the Greens have gone quiet on it, so if you can do anything to help with that, but that helps them to show that actually the community are here, we are watching, and if you go too far with some of these issues like cutting down really important trees, um, I'll declare an interest as the nature champion for oak in Parliament. I'm the oak tree champion. Um, <laughs> and I'm very fond of the cattle oaks at Chatelain Oak. But it's really, really serious. Health and well-being, obviously for climate nature emergency. But these are the issues that people get really upset about. And we need probably more tree preservation orders. But again, councils have lost lawyers. Again, it costs money to put it out to tender. So these are the, this is why we need proper funding for local government. Okay, well, sorry, sorry, the, um, the, the point you're making here is actually a much bigger point and there's a lot of policy out there that conflicts with each other. Yeah. One thing we don't have a problem with in Scotland is space. Yeah. You know, I, I, we have lots of space and it drives me insane that, that a lot of the, somehow, you know, I was actually um, this morning speaking to a whole lot of farmers in, in agritourism this morning. And they were talking about the planning system, whereas they can't get planning to, to develop their barns into a, you know, a, into a, a habitable, a habitable lens. Um, yeah, a big builder can go in and go into a, a buy, buy some some greenfield, you know, site and build build houses on it. You know, we're so, you know, it, it, the planning the planning system is all wrong in this country, for, in, in my in my view, and it needs a complete overhaul. And the other thing I think is, if you want to, you want true devolution, which which I really truly, truly believe in, is you need to devolve more power locally. And that means that means that a lot of the time that, that, that what happens is there'll be a planning application will go in quietly, and the only time that you see it is that you become aware of it is when the tree gets cut down. That you, you don't you don't see it. So I think that the, 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 a local voice is what's required. Is what's required here. We were supposed to be developing, you know, developing the, the, the Caledonian rainforest. We're supposed to be planting lots of trees. But then against that, we build all this Sidka spruce that dries out peatland, that releases carbon into the air. You know, you know, we're, 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 there's all these policies that conflict with each other. We want, we want to, you know, we want to hit net zero. We want to, hit, to develop climate change. But there's these policies over here that seem to act against it, and we need to start thinking. Exactly, we need to start thinking cross portfolio across the whole board under the banner of is this environmentally you know, is this environmentally friendly? Yeah, one or two points. Oddly enough, the, the single biggest casework issue I think I get as a councillor is trees in one form or another, and it's usually things like a, a gigantic tree has grown up over years at the back of a small council house kind of idea. Um, and people are, you know, it's overhanging next door. It's it's casting the, the the usual debris from the trees onto the onto the uh, next door house. It's blocking out the light and all that. You want the thing trimmed back or, or cut down. And I think we've we've got to and looking at all this. Look probably the practical realities of people people's lives. Some of these complaints are, are genuine. People got to you know, have houses that are livable in that aren't necessarily overshadowed by trees. We do want to plant many more trees. No two ways about yeah. that. 
But I think, I think the point that's come out of recent discussions is, as you rightly say, it's not a matter of, um, you know, there's a whole lot of the same kind of tree being planted in one place. It's, it's traditional brands. It's, it's a kind of um, um, a mix of trees that will actually sustain something that looks to the future. So you've got an actual industry, if you like, that, that goes through cycles on this. You know, I mean, the harvesting of timber is relevant to this, but also is the growing of the proper sorts of timber in the first place. So you've got that element of the thing. But thinking back to the, to the lady with the council house and the large tree, um, it does seem to me that one of the things we've got to do in this core climate thing, and this, this acting local thing, is to look at the lives of people in their own situations. And I know it's a broader point than the tree question you've made, but things like the electric supply to the house um, has got issues to do with, is it adequate to provide the electrical vehicle charging point that you're going to need to have if you're going to have an electric car? Um, is it going to be adequate to deal with the, um, with the supply for the cooker that um, is going to replace the gas cooker kind of idea, which is going to be all, all electric and take a, a big electric load on it? Uh, are there going to be issues like that that cause us problems? People don't understand, for example, how you're going to go forward on the new forms of technology with regard to heating systems, your ground source energy um, systems and things of that kind. I don't understand that, I have to confess uh, as well. But I think, I think these things are all barriers, that's really my point, towards moving forward on this, on this area and doing things which are going to make an actual difference. Because what happens on individual people's situations really is, is multiplied by the nation sort of idea, that's what's going to make the difference. We've got to remove a lot of these barriers, make the things work. And go back to the tree thing, there's got to be a, a bit of a balance between planting more trees, doing the things sensibly, avoiding people's tree houses being overshadowed by, by trees, but not losing the whole game into the, into the act, if you see what I mean. There's got to be uh, available ways of doing that. We're short of our border culturalists, amongst other things, who've got the expertise to advise on these things too. Okay, sorry, Gary. So if we can move on to the next question. Hi. Um, just listening to you all, it sounds like everybody's in agreement that we need to get to net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. But the problem seems to be how are we going to <coughs> do it and how are we going to agree on how to get there. So I was just wondering, in terms of councils and government, I guess, How do councils um, agree on where to target the reduction in climate emissions? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important if you're doing that, uh, how do you measure how well you're doing? Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Yeah. Love your last bit there. How do we measure mm -hmm. whether we're being successful or not? So I, I started off by saying we've got some world class targets in this country. We've got world class targets. We're having a hope in hell of hitting some of them. We've got, a, we've got a, a government policy that says we're going to retrofit a million homes in five years with heat pumps. Utter nonsense. Who's going to pay for it, for a start? Who's going to fit them and who's going to service them? So it's about, it's about and, if you, and the cost of that is astronomical to, to do that. And I, I actually looked at, I've just changed my, uh, my uh, heat system in the house. I wanted to put an air sourced heat pump in. I want to do my bit three times the cost of a gas boiler. So I asked about can I have a, a can I have a boiler fitted that will be able to use hydrogen when it you know in case that comes down the road. No you can't. So we're not even close. We're, we're creating all these targets and we're not even close. I think that's where we get so frustrated in Parliament, is that we all absolutely agree. Absolutely agree that all of these things have to be done, but they have to be done connected to each other. You can't do them in isolation. There's not much point coming up with, we're going to create a, a, a million a million homes fitted with heat pumps. One, there's not, we don't need to fit a million homes with heat pumps because it's, 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 it depends you know, where they are. I would like to see, for example, if we're going to hit, hit, um, fit heat pumps, the place to start is where the, where the houses are off the grid and are run with the most you know, inefficient boilers, which is oil. Why don't we target that? Why don't, why don't we have a plan that says that's where we're going to go? We're going to start with it and work our way, uh, work our way in. Why? There's enough heat in the Clyde uh, uh, to heat the whole of Glasgow. 
why are we not doing that? Why are we not doing that that kind of policy? And I think that that's really what you know Monica and I role is because we're in opposition, is to push these things forward and to try and, and, and get the government to move into a position where it's going to deliver on these things. When we're tree planting the right tree in the right place at the right time, I was talking about that in Parliament uh, last year. It's not enough to plant acres and acres and acres of Sitka spruce. Because that's not that, that's gonna not, not gonna help us with, with, with climate change. That's just gonna dry the land out, dry the peat out. And in fact it, the reason that I was talking about that last week is it's because it, believe it or not, it's killing wild salmon. You know, by we're not planting riparian forest, we're not developing Caledonian rainforest. So we're not looking. I mean, one of the big the big thing you're probably looking at at the moment in Parliament is around uh, highly protected marine areas and how we we're not managing um, uh, the spatial uh, marine spatial planning is, is terrible. It's, it's worse there than it is on land here. We're not joining up all the dots. And the th the, the, the frustrating thing is you're absolutely right. All us bloody politicians agree with the, what the outcome that we want. We just can't seem to get get it together where we, 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 we have a route map, we have great targets, but we must, must force the government to come to the table with a route map that says that's how we're getting there. Because we can't afford to miss it. Don't talk about everybody else outside of Scotland and around the rest of the world, because there's much, bigger, much bigger problems. We have to hit our target if we are going to do our bit to keep one and a half uh, alive. And currently we're not doing that. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that, but that's part. That's, it's part of the same problem. You know, we you know we, we talk about the, the, the state of our rivers and the state of our seas and the state of our water, but we but, but SEPA only uh, look at four percent, four percent. So how on earth do you measure how, what what's happening here? The, the, the last thing you said was probably the most important thing. How do you measure it? And currently, we haven't got the measurement systems in place, and we need to force government to do that. I just want to that. I'm just, we do have pretty good measurement systems for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the challenge we have is, so for a long time Scotland has been able to mask its challenges because overall our emissions have fallen. The main reason our emissions have fallen is because of the big expansion of renewables in the 2010s. And that has hidden the fact that in almost every other area things have been static if not actually increasing, so transport, high energy. Um, those emissions have been increasing, not decreasing. And so in terms of prioritisation, we really need to look at those areas. What are our biggest polluters? How do we get those down and how do we get those down quickly? Um, and there is a danger that we're drifting too far to the, well, let's just do more renewable energy and cover our blushes. That isn't really going to wash anymore. There's only so much you can expand. And in particular in Scotland, we have the challenge that we don't have full control of the grid because the national grid is reserved to, to the UK government. And so things like making sure people can have the energy supply to their homes to enable them to do small scale renewables at home, feed it into the grid, or to install air, air source heat pumps, um, there's not the capacity there. So it's expensive and it's difficult for the Scottish government to deal with those particular issues. But that doesn't let the Scottish government off the hook. We can still invest in renewables, we can still do a better job of that. What we need to do is look at the areas where we've really been failing. And that, I mean, predominantly is transport, uh, but it is also home energy and agriculture. To an extent, agriculture has been very, very static in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I think you raise an, uh, an important point. We do have very ambitious targets and we all agree on the need for it. And it is backed by significant investment but I'm not here just to you know, praise the government because that's not going to get that's not going to move us forward. Uh, I think part of your question was around how do you know, councils agree and how do we target the investment. It is difficult uh, especially with you know limited budgets, uh, councils have limited budgets and so does the, the Scottish government. Uh, but we need to make the tough decisions now for the 
the sake of our future. Uh, I think uh, I can't remember who, who initially said it, but the the cost of uh, not acting now uh, outweighs the outweighs the cost of if we do act just now. Uh, so we do need to make significant investment, and we do need to work. Cross party I mentioned earlier, uh, it was actually a motion from the Green Council to Financial that I worked together on with her uh, to encourage more energy efficiency in council buildings. Uh, so it's difficult, I don't have all the answers to it, but we need to keep having these conversations, understand what's important to communities. So events like these, uh, perhaps there's more we can do on uh, empowering communities when it comes to the, the planning process and so on, understand more about what's uh, important to people and also make sure that people feel the or see the benefits of the things that we're doing uh, and, you know, for targeting the, the energy companies if for you know, putting their tax up, people need to see the, the benefit of that and you know, their energy bills uh, and so on so there is a lot of action that we can take and there is broad consensus but I think it's important we have that debate and that scrutiny of governments, councils so that we can move forward in the best way possible. Um, so I've got my, my notepad tonight that says optimist on the front so when it all starts to feel a bit much that kind of reminds me that we actually know what we need to do. We already have the data, the science, um, we have really good policy, we've got legislation, of course we need to always uh, update that, but it's this tricky part now if we just have to get on and do it, and it's like we have to do everything all at once and we have to do it really quickly. So having said that, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think the polluter pays principle is really important. So again, just to go back to those poor oil and gas companies, you know, who are making their, you know, billions in profits. So there's a lot that they could do. They could be paying more uh, uh, in taxation to provide um, some of the, the carrots that we need because we do need to incentivise people, uh, particularly people, uh, you know, uh, who are in um, their own homes, whether that's in the rented sector, um, or they own their own homes because to make that transition to be more energy efficient um, to, to have the right technology that's an investment but there's much more we could do to give people grants and to give people loans that make it more affordable over a longer period of time so that next time Brian's looking at maybe thinking about his, his heating system there's a range of options available to him but there's some of us including those in the table who could afford to pay a bit more towards our, our heating costs and you know, back Brian's point about electric cars. Central Scotland's a big region too, with lots of rural parts, and I've had my electric car for about two years, and I've never run out of battery yet, although I do sometimes get range anxiety. So, again, it's a how do we give people confidence? So I'm going to try and make Brian more confident about using electric cars. I'll give him a, a wee shot of mine. Um, but it's about that, those carrots and sticks. As long as you're not Car driving. I'm a really good driver. Carrots, <laughs> carrots and sticks. <laughs> but this is a, this is a, it's not just about talking about, oh, how can we more green? It's about how do we reorganise our economy? so yeah. that we actually value the right things in society. How do we invest in our public services? How do we support the third sector? How do we support small businesses, social enterprises? Now, I'm looking at your pop-up banner here because some of you um, who know me in the room know that I'm very upset about the, the X1 bus being taken away from Hamilton. That was our express service to Glasgow. But I want to learn from you and Straven about what other models exist, what else can we do? Um, thinking about, so that's transport, thinking about energy. Look at the energy that we're wasting. So Tom's sitting at the back very quietly, but Tom's a, an expert in the room in terms of thermal imaging and energy efficiency. Look at the energy that we lose in our homes because of you know, drafty, um, you know, windows and, and, and buildings that are not performing as well as they should be. And again, that's partly because 
we ask developers and house builders to write every certificate, but nobody at the council has got the time to actually look at that and say, is this like proper to the right standard? So I think retrofitting, let's not just think about it as a cost, it's a massive investment in all of us, all of our um, families, but think about the jobs that that would create, and it's for local people who would then spend their wages in local shops, in the community, and that is about trying to get that community wealth building, um, which I know that Councillor Joe Fagan, as leader, is, is very um, passionate about. Also nationally, we've got the, the, the National Investment Bank now, the Scottish National Investment Bank. They can't directly fund local government, but I think there's interesting things that could happen to see how do we leave it in you know, ethical, responsible finance, because it can't all come from central and local government. But I do think we have to be braver and bolder around progressive taxation. I think Hamza Yusuf has said some you know, encouraging things about the wellbeing economy and about taxation, but we need to see um, some action. I actually think it's, it's politics that is getting in the way because of our election cycle and we're in the next election, but this is a critical period. And I think my plea to all of you is, I need all of you to be very vocal um, and to keep on at all of us in our political parties because we are running out of time. But I'm still very uh, optimistic to answer the question. Robert? I think mean, there's two sides to this. I mean, Monica's right, obviously, that the taxation element is, is important in, in drawing money in that regard. We were the first party, actually, to call for a windfall tax. Uh, on the profits of the oil and gas companies that they've come to them fortuitously, if you like, through this um, particular um, energy crisis that we've had. Um, so that's part of it, and, and reasonably clearly got a whole series of challenges for the public sector in terms of what they do there. I mean, I'll give you one small example in a way. Um, some of us on the panel were at the meeting in Lark Hall recently, but the Lark Hall Leisure Centre, which has gone from a, a, um, an estimated cost of 11.5 million to one of 23 million approximately, um, uh, partly because of just inflationary costs we're facing at the moment, but partly also because of the higher standards that have to be put into the thing in order to uh, meet, meet, the, meet the climate change requirements that we now have, quite rightly. So there's some big issues there in terms of funding public sector projects, which are more difficult and more challenging than they used to be. But in actual reality, if you talk about retrofitting, I remember the chief executive of the council talking in glowing terms about this just before the end of the last council, and he said, well, retrofitting is the thing of the future, and the, the impression was that large amounts of, um, of magic money tree money was going to come through from central government over time in order to actually fund this, and of course, nothing much has happened in that particular direction. And the reality is that a good deal of what has to happen there is... Um, there's got to be money that's, that's done through the private sector because you've got to create a market. You've got to make a market that works, for example, with, with the ground source heat pumps to bring down the cost of them. Solar panels is a good example as well. I mean, solar panel repayment period for the investment used to be something of the order of 10 or 15 years, I think I'm right in saying. I was talking to a, a local company who said they'd, they'd recently installed solar panels and because of the increasing cost and various other changes, one and a half years was the repayment period that they'd experienced for their particular project. So clearly, if you like, the market has moved forward there. The economics of doing solar panels are much better than what they used to be a little while ago. And um, the same thing applies to some of these other technologies as well. The Scottish Government gives a grant, I think, of £7,500 for installation of heat pump installation. But the, the, there's a gap of about 4500 between it and the real cost. Now, that may come down, and I think it's everybody's interest that it does come down, but it'll only come down once there's a, um, you know, a large number of these things being done, and it's moving forward, you've got, a, you've got the economies of scale that go with it. So I think you've got that element of the thing as well, to create a market, which is really quite important to make that actually happen. Again, just to look at the gap, we're talking about, I think, a £33 billion price gap, price tag for the heat and building strategy, and £1.8 billion of funding has been put towards that. There's got to be new methods of doing this. And to my mind, it's the revenue stream coming in from the savings on the, the cost of the electric or the energy supply that can actually fund up front. And you've got to make mechanisms of doing that, whether it's from, as you say, ethical investment companies, whether it's from um, investors of other kinds who can see a profit on this at the end of the day, uh, and whether in particular it's individuals who can actually manage to, you know, to can be supported in the upfront costs 
and we're right at the other end of the, of the, of the thing with savings on the electricity beyond that. All these issues, I think, are quite important to this area. Can I, can I just join? Can we just, just, I want to join a few dots up here. Here's some questions. Why is there a house built in this country without a solar, solar panels on the ceiling anymore? Hmm. Why is that? Yeah. Why are we not, like they do in France, if you have a car park over a certain size, you have to have solar panels across the whole top. It's not even touching the grid. That does the charging points. Why are we not thinking in terms of that? Why are we not thinking in terms of, uh, you know, if we're going to do a just transition away from oil and gas, we need to invest really heavily in things like, you know, uh, green hydrogen is, is a huge uh, potential for Scotland. Why are we not, why are we not putting, the, the BP have put a, a, a hydrogen, or paid for a hydrogen hub up in the northeast, but it's not, we're not thinking big enough. We need to be thinking bigger than all these things joined together, start to be form a, a, a jigsaw of the solution that we require. We fight about bits and pieces of it, but all of these things can be done. For the life of me, I will never know why we build houses without solar panels on the ceiling. It's absolutely insane for yeah. my money. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, I think there's a question. Yeah. Um, question to Laura, but she mentioned earlier on about the community activity around uh, buying property and renovating and bringing it back to some community life and benefit. I'd be interested to hear a bit more about that. But to the whole panel, um, you're now the benign dictator of Scotland. Um, you have control. Oof. There are a lot of genetics tonight and a lot of talk about plans and route maps and interconnectedness. But actually, what would you do? What was the one thing you could do that made a difference? Do you want to answer the question about um, the community um, ownership? Um, yeah, uh, so Meet Civil Quarters project is a priest, it's been going for about five years now. Um, it kind of, it started actually um, as a bit of an artist project. Uh, there's an organisation called the Stove Network and Freeze, which is a group of creatives. They got together and were like, what can we do to make our town better? And they came up with all sorts of great ways to reach out to the community and get people talking about what they wanted to see in Dumfries. And Dumfries, um, it's a big town, but like a lot of towns, it's it's an old market mm. town, and it's a market town without a market. It's 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 like a cold town without pit. It's the same thing. The big multinationals came in, built cheap, big shops in the centre of town, then went out of town and left the desert behind them. So um, one bizarre upside of all of this, and the COVID pandemic, and a number of other factors, is that property in the centre of town is cheap. You can buy a three-storey, 18th century building with a huge amount of retail floor space in the centre of Dumfries for about 200 grand. So because of legislation that <coughs> come through the Scottish Parliament, things like the Community Empowerment Act, Community Rights Buy, um, there's a lot of mechanisms out there to enable communities to do that. So the community set up a community benefit society, they went about making a business case, they got supplementary planning guidance into the local plan <laughs> which sounds really dull but was really key to mean that those buildings in the town now didn't just have to be shops they could be other things and that meant we could buy those buildings and know that as well as making the shop from like this one used for community uses or for businesses we could also convert the upper floors um, and then they went about getting funding to do all of that. So they're just about, I think in the autumn they'll finish the first redevelopment, which took a three-storey building and is turning it into seven flats and a big community slash retail slash exhibition space. But while they were waiting to do that, they didn't just sit and twiddle their thumbs. We went and bought five other buildings in the same block. One of them is now fully occupied on three floors with artists and creatives. And then the other ones are let out as pop up shops while we look into different ways of dealing with them. So it's a mass, it's a lot for a community to undertake. It was a lot to take on, but um, it's, it's got the potential to transform them free. And there is absolutely no reason why other towns can't do exactly the same thing. It just takes a huge amount of volunteer time, energy, and effort. But we know that money is going to be locked up then for the community and stay in the community rather than. What was previously the case, these buildings being held as assets on an overseas pension fund, asset lodge, and not actually working for the communities. So that was a possibility. Yeah, it's yeah, to your benign dictator question. <laughs> uh, not sure how comfortable I am with that, that title, but uh, apart from making sure we get a work called New Local Leisure Centre, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I could pick 
one thing. I will definitely want us to <coughs> accelerate what we're doing. We're already doing a lot, but we do need to do a lot more. Uh, if I had to pick you know, one thing, it would be probably to make sure we introduce more of a, a meaningful windfall tax and make sure we use more of the, the profits the big energy companies are getting to actually benefit people with their energy bills because uh, people are really struggling right now but uh, I, I think we should definitely look at all the options we can to accelerate our response to the climate crisis uh, but yes I'm not too keen on being a benign dictator <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about that UK Climate Change Committee report, which up until maybe last year when that came out, the Scottish Government was getting lots of plaudits for having really bold targets and really high ambition. So we're not going to criticise government for having that ambition and that vision. But they're now saying, as a committee, look, there is a danger here. To Brian's point, there's a danger here. This is going to amount to magical thinking if you don't get on and hurry up. So one of the big areas in that report is around decarbonising transport. Now, I don't know why, but when First Ministers and, and leaders are handing out jobs in government, apparently getting transport is like a, a punishment or you you know, you put the people that you don't particularly like into transport. <laughs> and we've got a transport system in Scotland that's not performing as it should be. It's not properly integrated. And a term that I hear a lot in Parliament on the Net Zero Energy Transport Committee is about bus deserts, whole communities in Scotland yeah. where you just can't get a bus. You can get a free bus pass if you're a certain age. Now, for 22 year olds and under, that's great. But like when I am at the top end of Blantyre in Hamilton, you know, my daughter's 16, so she's got a free bus pass now, but the bus that served our community no longer exists. So that's a ludicrous situation. So I think something really serious needs to happen in government about how we view transport. Um, I also know that for public transport, um, you know, it's um, predominantly you know, used by women, people in lower incomes, people who are more likely to be in, in, in poverty, people from black and ethnic minority communities as well. Um, and it's just getting harder to get around. So yes, it's about the climate emergency, but it's also about an economy. We've got businesses right now who've got people who work in their, whether it's a pub or a restaurant or people in social care, and they can't get to their work. Um, we've got taxi drivers who've had to take their vehicles off the roads because there's just so many issues. They were some of the last to get support uh, in COVID in terms of grants for, for them as sole traders. So there's all these issues, and I'm a central belt MSP, but one of my jobs in the committee was to go to the Western Isles as part of our inquiry into Scotland's ferry services, not to look back at what's happened at Ferguson Marine and things like that. Other committees are doing that, but to look forward, what does a sustainable uh, ferry service look like? It's actually more than just about thinking about the ferries. It's about you know um, connectivity for our island communities. And I was in a, a sort of round table discussion with folk who, who work in healthcare and they were saying we cannot get uh, social care workers, people can't afford to get here, the ferries are unreliable. So it affects our whole society, um, I would say, Andy. So I think something really bold and different needs to happen around transport. Um, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be integrated. You have to have services running that align with people's lives, whether you're a shift worker, whether you're trying to you know, visit family or, or whatever. Um, I think we've got some good policies like the free bus pass for you know, people over 60, people under 22, but you need to have the, the service um, and that needs to tie in with people that want to get their, their, their bike on the train or you know, on the bus and so on. And, and also for disabled people who uh, are wheelchair users, the buses can be a real nightmare as well. So transport should no longer be uh, seen as like, oh, that's a rubbish job that we hand out to a minister that we don't really like. Like transport has to be up there as a really important job in government. And it needs that leadership across local government um, 
um, as well. So decarbonising tra transport is, is essential. Well, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> <laughs> I have a list. Uh, obviously, the, the stuff I said, the, the stuff, the stuff I said earlier on. I mean, the, the first thing I would do, I think, that what the, we, we talked about, you know, joining portfolios together. The first thing I would do is that about green jobs or developing new green jobs? I think the first thing we've got to do is weave the green economy into our education system because we're not doing that. We're not developing the people. Um, who, can, who, can, who can work in the industry. We, we've talked, we, Monica talked about White Lees, which is in, in, in my area as well. White Lees is, is owned by Scottish Power, which is owned by Iberdrola. And was, uh, all those things were imported, and, the, and uh, we, import, we import the servicing of those machines as well. That is insane. That is a whole industry, a whole industry that, that, should, that should be here in Scotland. That's not that, so the, the education system for me, is absolutely key. We should have we have the green economy woven into that. But talk about things like, you know, I mean, I've long campaigned for the development of the A77, A75 from Cairn Ryan, and you say, building roads, surely that's the wrong thing to do. Not if you create electric hydrogen superhighways. Not if you have a, if you develop the train train link down to, to Cairn Ryan and put a spur off, a spur off uh, into Cairn Ryan. There's 110 44 tonne lorries come out of Cairn Ryan and up the A77 every single day go through all the towns, for goodness sake, create a decent road. The, the, the lorry drivers, the, the lorry owners want to have hydrogen powered uh, lorries. They're available, but they, but they can't refuel them. So create, you know, start to create a way of get, we seem to be, uh, what we're doing is trying to prevent people from moving around, trying to prevent people from doing things. What we need to do is give them alternatives you know, so we don't want to change people's life drastically. We want to change that by in incrementally and allow allow people to do the same things, but in a clean environment. So there's there's a whole there's a whole industry, there's a whole economy that we could build around the development of hydrogen, around the development of, of um, um, uh, EVs, around the thing. We, we talked about the, the grid. The grid's a big problem. But what I would like to see is I was described to me by Chris Stark, who's the chair of the the, the, the climate executive. committee, chief executive. I, I I do go out and lunch with Chris because I just let's and pick his brains. It's, it's like he described it to me as like a honeycomb. So you should be able to strive and and should be able to develop its own power source here, and it can be done. It was supposed to be done in Cumnock. It's supposed to take Cumnock off the grid, and then they water that down. And it was described as kind of a honeycomb. So you create that view of a river or, or, or come, come through, that's, that's your power source. But it's connected to the, the, the next one as well. So if you over, if you've got, you over, it, it slides into the next. And if you've, un, if you've got under power, it slides back again. The, 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 to, to try and create, to develop the grid as it currently stands, quite frankly, is not going to happen. We, we, we just can't do it. So we have to start thinking about taking, um, taking uh, big chunks of towns and whatnot off the grid, and we can do that. Innovation is the way forward. We need to start investing in innovation. The the um, uh, the bank, the what do you call it? the national invest, the national it's called a national investment bank, is not doing what it was supposed to do. It's lending money just now at over ten percent, double what they're doing in in the high street. How is that helping? We seem to be very risk averse. As well, if if we're going to invest in innovation, you have to be prepared to fail now and again. That doesn't come out. Can I just supplement what Brian said, because I'm, I'm sure he's not being. It. It, it. it feels a little bit glass half full. But what I would say, so on the Net Zero Committee, one of our, you know, the great things is we hear about innovation mm -hmm. and we hear about good practice. So what I would say, what we've observed as a committee, there are pockets of good practice. Yep. So for example, you talked about hydrogen vehicles. Yep. So we went to Aberdeen, they've got hydrogen bin lorries, they've got buses. hydrogen buses. Yep. It's happening in Aberdeen now, the hydrogen bin lorry is three times the price of buying, you know, a regular one. Mm. So, but that council has obviously made that decision and there's been some funding available for that. We've got, and we could give examples of like solar and, yeah, yeah. and other councils. So we're seeing pockets of best practice, but then, now maybe it's because the funding that's been given to help mm. that go off the ground doesn't then continue and it's not sustainable. But I don't want people walking away tonight thinking we're really far behind. In some respects we are, but see if we could scale up some of this really good practice and get that joined up thinking and that leadership. You know, I don't want us to feel, oh, we're so far away. It's there, we can see it, we can see these projects, 
And a lot of it, some of it's not led by government, some of it's not led by councils, some of it's led by the community, and we should never lose sight of that. So if we are that wee bit more optimistic, we can see that good practice innovation, but how do we get that scaled well, up? Well, I'm, I'm, but I am, as you, you know me, Monica, <laughs> I'm very upbeat all the time. <laughs> um, what I think what frustrates me is we have got the tools and the tech to deliver on this right here, right now. Innovation is the way forward. We need to continue to. I think innovation gets us out of this uh, um, this this crisis, and I think some of the solutions that, that that will get us out of this crisis are yet to be invented. I would just like them invented in Scotland. We have the capability of doing it in Scotland. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it, it's there's a there's a there's two two sides to this. I've been trying to help a couple of companies, one in hydrogen, one in waste management. You know, navigate their way through the red tape to get to to get to grant funding, and it's just. And by the way, that's not just Scottish government; that's UK government as well. Both I've spoken to both. They need to make it simpler, and they need to be prepared to now and again fail, because that's what that's what innovation is about. You know, so we we've got some fantastic uh, technology companies in this country. We've got some fantastic th great thinkers in this country. We need to set them free, you know, and because we're going to get out of this. I'd like Scotland to be at the forefront. We've got some fantastic technology companies, in fact, in South Lanarkshire in particular, and I think that's one of the actual um, things I've sort of learned going round and visiting them uh, over the course of the last the last period. And I think the actual leadership does come from these companies, but there are often hiccups on supply chains and the little companies that support them and all that mm, sort of yeah. stuff makes it much more difficult. Now, we're not going to be able to solve that by government, but we can contribute towards it. We can put some degree of support in and we can, we can zone in the grants to make them more acceptable in that kind of way. The grid point was something I think I began with what I, what I said at the beginning. I think you've got a, a mixture of really the grid itself and the localised arrangements within it. Clyde Gateway, which organised um, a lot of the urban regeneration around the Rotherland and um, East Glasgow end, um, have got um, a district heating scheme um, in the Dalmanach area, which is actually very productive in that regard and I think is, is likely to lead to stable you know, energy arrangements yeah. for the households and the businesses that live in that area, and it's capable of being replicated elsewhere. There are other examples of that, that sort of thing around the country. Um, you asked, I think, the original question was about one thing. I think the less of this really is there is not one thing. There's a whole series of interconnected um, actions that have to be taken to get this critical mass up, to get the markets going, to get everything happening in a way we happen. We need to um, see going forward. I would single out one or two things, if I may, though. One, I think, is public information. We certainly need route maps, but we don't need route maps just for government. We need route maps for individuals. How do you make your lifestyle and your house more eco-friendly, as it were? How, how do you get across the barriers? How much does it cost you? Who do you go to about um, you know, the, new, the new heating systems and the, 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 the retrofit and all this? How is it done? There must be a kind of ability to produce a sort of standard pack for this, this kind of thing, which would be of some assistance as well. So clear public information on costs and options. We need, I think, a programme to support council investment, which is part of creating the market as well, because uh, sometimes we, we go to places which um, you know, the private industry won't, won't support. So support council buildings retrofit and, and also the installation of solar panels on every school in South Lanarkshire, for example. That requires funding. Can we have the funding, please? Can we restore the capital grant that's been taken away by the Scottish Government over a period where we've got a reduced spend in terms of the national cake coming the way of local government who have to do these sort of things? Can we do something with regard to the training and supply chain problems? I mean, is there a potential for a task force perhaps in that particular direction of travel? Transport is a much bigger one. I don't think anybody would disagree with Monica's um, um, tirade about that particular matter. But the, the, reality, the, the reality is... That was me holding back. I know, I know. But the, 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 the reality is we've had a particular difficulty there since COVID and fact before. The bus usage has gone down over the last decade by a substantial and increasing amount. And it's particularly been made worse during COVID and the levels haven't gone back. Now, no revenue coming in because of usages, less investment. The whole thing is a vicious circle. How do we change that and get round it? Even the, even the rail companies, we've had some big successes, haven't we, in opening new stations and this kind of thing across Scotland, the borders, rail, but also some, some other ones as well. Potential for taking that one forward, but they're very expensive. 
And you've also had at the same time some of the train companies being taken back into national ownership because they made a, a bit of a hash of it. Now, I don't think that's just incompetence. I think it's also the financial pressures that exist on delivering the, the actual item there. So some big issues about that and big investment. I don't pretend to have the answers to that particular one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> Well, I guess my overriding frustration is the idea of action and urgency. And mm -hmm. I agree with practically everything I've heard from the panel tonight, apart from very specifically Robert and Brian talking about your faith in the oil industry to um, invest you know, in well, new... Not what I said. I didn't say that. Well, you said. talked about um, we need them to invest. They need the market, I think, to deliver some of the solutions. Uh -huh. We went to the market to set up a bus for Australia. The market said it wasn't viable, so we just went and did it. So the market doesn't have all the answers. Um, the, the Secretary General of the UN said that current policies mean we're heading for 2.8 degrees of warming mm. by the end of the century. And he said that this is a dead sentence. This is a dead sentence. Okay. So if this is a dead sentence, are you happy with what you're doing at the minute? Can I, can I get, there's something I want to come in, come in with here you know, that we haven't got to here, and it's individual responsibility here. And one of the things I've been working on, you know, all of, all of this, all of this, this is relevant and, you know, I, I never said I was, I'm not, in, I'm, I'm certainly not in bed with the oil and gas companies, but I've got to, got to be really careful how we deal with that. Um, but food waste, things like food waste, huge. If food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter in the world behind China and USA. If we, if we could save 20% of the food that we waste, we would solve uh, uh, food poverty in the world. So I think we, you know, whether, when we look at governments, and so we should look at governments, and we, and we should be questioned for what we do, uh, and we should be pushed to do further. But we also have to look at what we as an individual do. I think sometimes we'll lose that, what can I as an individual, what difference can I possibly make? No, I think that's reflecting, Brian. No, it's not. Individuals can do a lot, and community groups can do a lot, and companies can do a lot, but ultimately, it's the politicians. If I was allowed to go and paint a bus lane on the M8, I'd have done it by now. If I was allowed to improve building standards across Scotland, I'd have done it by now. We're relying on our elected politicians in Hamilton, in Edinburgh, and in London, uh -huh. and around the world, really to step up. And my question is, the Secretary General of the UN, who's the most senior politician, arguably, in the world, let's mm -hmm. call him that, he's expressing his frustration. He's saying, we're en route. It's a dead sentence. Mm -hmm. so my question is, are you comfortable with what you're doing? No, I mean, that's, that's it's my, my job is to try and put pressure on the Scottish Government to go further than it is and go faster than it is. That's that's my job, and I completely agree with you. There's other things we haven't, we haven't talked about. The blue economy, seven-eighths of a planet is covered in water. We haven't talked about that either. There is so much we should and could be doing, and we're not doing it. And it's and it's the role of, you know, Monica and I as in opposition is to try and push the Scottish Government and the UK Government and anybody else we can influence to go faster than it currently is, but there's a, there's a, it, it, it's a collective thing. It's like, you know, we, we create the framework. We create, the, well, the Parliament creates the framework for this to happen. We have to make sure that any promises that are made by any government, they stick to it because we can't afford to miss it because we, we can't afford to go above one and a half degrees. It is a death sentence, you're absolutely right, but it's a collective, what I was saying, it's a, there's, a, there's a collective here. We all have a part to play. Right, I know there's not many minutes left, but <laughs> <laughs> well done, Tom. This is really going to heat us up. But, you know, we're, we're from different political parties, right? So I've tried not to sit here and say, you know, this is my party, this is what we're doing, we're better. But I will speak for myself and say, you know, as a socialist, then clearly I do believe that public ownership is, is, is really key in a lot of this. That's about how we decarbonise the economy, but how we also democratise our economy, our society. So, Brian talked about individual responsibility. Um, this is about system change, you know, on a global level, but a national level, and obviously locally here in a, in a council basis. So, you're absolutely right, you know, the frustrations that you've touched on about the, the, the bus lanes on the motorway or lack of... Uh, the, the weaknesses in our building standards system to make sure that our homes are properly performing, that we have proper insulation and so on. It is a, a, an ecological and a, and a climate emergency, but it's also about social justice. It's about poverty. So 
Robert did touch on fuel poverty. It's an absolute scandal. The committee, they sent me away a lot of places. I was in Orkney. And again, what's going on there in terms of tidal energy and, and opportunities around renewables, but some of the highest levels of fuel poverty in Scotland. So we can't keep looking the other way and expect somebody to come in, you know, a new first minister, a new cabinet. So it is about the whole system, how we do things. Now, governments should lead by example and should set an example to others in the world. <coughs> so, for example, I asked some parliamentary questions about how many government buildings have an air source heat pump. Because if you're <laughs> struggling to put one in, yeah. we need to know the government are doing it in their own estate. And I think the answer was two. I think, I think it was two that need to connect it and say it was actually only one, but they've got this pilot scheme coming up. That's the government's own buildings. So we've really got to start practicing uh, what we what we preach. So I think again massive opportunities, but I know it's probably not a popular campaign. So I would say I want to put people in jail, but that's what Stop Ecocide campaign is about. It's about saying it's not enough to say right, Ross, stop using plastic bottles and right, Brian, get in an electric car when we've still got Shell and BP and Equinor and others setting the planet on fire. So that's why the Ecocide Law campaign, which is trying to, at an international court, um, criminal court level, is have that on par with genocide and war crimes, crimes against you know people and humanity. There isn't a, an equivalent for, um, for the environment and for, for nature. So that's why I'm not going to sit here and be pragmatic. You know, I want to put these companies in jail. It's not going to be retrospective, so we're putting them on notice. But that's how serious it has to be. And by doing that, because what they're actually already doing, um, you know, the, the big global operators, the best finance people in the world are telling them, look, this is coming. And it's going to be a major risk to your business, to your reputation. So you better start changing your ways now. That's how we get behaviour change on a global level. Um, not to let individuals off the hook, but if we don't change the system, some of the very small changes that we're making, it just won't be enough. So if you can sign up on the Ecoside Law website, become an earth protector and support the global campaign. The EU has been passing loads of um, motions on this recently. And the good news is that the Scottish Government will say that they will keep um, aligned with the EU on environmental protection. So we could see this coming to Scotland quicker uh, than maybe some people had realised. I, I, I didn't actually give my answers to the benign dictatorship. Oh. Was <laughs> <laughs> I'm waxing lyrical about uh, Mr. Porter, which community ownership is part of the problem. But I think what, what's been really clear for the panel is that dealing with climate crisis is like pulling threats and you start pulling on something and trying to make a change in one area and, and there's a problem somewhere else and, and, you, and you feel like you're constantly <coughs> violating. Um, so it, Monica's right, it needs to be structural um, and it needs to be deep and I think you can't just pick one policy. Um, that's a bit of a cop out, but you know, I think you need to look at how are you going to raise money for it? Um, wealth taxes, carbon taxes, land taxes. Things we don't really tax at the moment and we need to to make the to pay and to actually change the way society is structured. What do we use that for? Part of the reason we can't tackle public transport effectively is because we don't own it. It is not fully publicly owned. It's incredibly difficult to get all these companies working together, <coughs> doing the right thing. We end up in ludicrous situations like giving thousands of pounds of grants to a private company to get electric buses who then raise prices by 15% in a single year. And they're scratching their head about why people aren't using these lovely electric buses. We need to do with that. And the other thing is, we need people. Um, these the, part of the issue with rural bus transport, where I am, is not the lack of wanting to provide bus services. There's no drivers. There are no drivers for my kids' school bus. They had to cancel the school bus several times in the last term because there were no drivers. So we need to rejoin the single market, go back to freedom of movement, get people here, and train the next generation for the jobs we need because it's desperate. Yeah, I'm not comfortable with what we're doing. I don't think we should ever be comfortable with what we're doing uh, un until we get there. Uh, we've, we've provided really important leadership so far. Scotland uh, in combating climate change, one of the first countries to uh, declare a climate emergency. Uh, that's all well and good, but of course we need to back that up with the investment in the continuous 
scrutiny of that and making sure we're always doing more. And I think, I think it was slightly touched on as well that we do need to work with other countries. We can't just look inward all the time, you know, learn from best practice, international agreements such as the Paris Agreement, uh, events like COP26. Uh, I, I think it's disappointing that the UK government try to limit Scotland's engagement internationally. Uh, and I think we need to do a lot, do more of it. Uh, and we need to do more certainly to help those which are most affected by climate change. Uh, you mentioned a, a death sentence. Uh, if we don't do more internationally, in terms of you know, international aid and so on, we'll see a lot more climate refugees, uh, which is you know pretty frightening to see some of the, the stats on that. Uh, we're one of the, the first countries to do a, a climate justice fund. Perhaps we need to look more about you know expanding that, targeting it, uh, working more internationally again. Uh, but I, I'm not, as I, as I said at the start, I'm not comfortable, uh, and we continuously advance our response and uh, scrutinise the politicians, scrutinise the councils, MSPs, MPs, either governments of any party, uh, and never be comfortable with what we're doing. Yes, I think there's critical mass in a lot of this sort of stuff, isn't there? That, you, know, you reach a certain level where the ideas are coming in, they're meeting the kind of financial investment and, and the, the, the systems are in place to deal with it. And I think that's what we've seen to some degree in a number of, number of other areas. And I am a bit obsessed on the funding thing. I remember the, the time when we were in government of Scotland where we did the stock transfer in Glasgow. I don't know if people remember that. This was the whole issue of trying to make sure that the investment went into the council housing that we had at that time, uh, which had been neglected over a, a number of years, and they found mechanisms to do it. That's really the point I wanted to make, not so much about the council housing as such. They found mechanisms to do it. I don't think we've yet found the mechanisms to actually fund the retrofit, the investment, the sort of things we want to see here. And that's, I think, one of, one of the biggest challenges for government. At our level, my level on the council, to be quite frank, we are a, we're a, a potential delivery agency within all, within all this and a leader of the local um, things that happen. But frankly, we're very much dependent on the funding that might be available from, from the centre in some shape or other. Uh, we can do an awful lot. I think the councils are the agencies of making big change. I think we showed during uh, the COVID um, pandemic how local government and local communities could react in a far more flexible fashion than government, whether at Scottish level or the UK level, were able to do. So I think that's part of the issue as well. But I do take some issue, I think, with, with the issue of um, the, the private industry thing, because um, at the end of the day, the, the money involved in this is humendous. There's no question about it at all. Um, most of it is not going to come directly from the public sector. It maybe is going to be guided in that way, but it's not going to come directly from that. It's going to come from the private sector and it's going to come from the, um, from the new industries that we're, we're developing, the green jobs, the green businesses, the local things there, filling the gaps, encouraging the companies we've got. And it's going to be coming from accessing the funding that's available in some of these ways as well. And I don't well, think we should I understate think that. I think it's really, really important yeah. to say, though, that the oil and gas companies get a lot of subsidy. They get a lot of yeah, public yeah, money yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. It's not just all their own money. No, no, they no, make no. huge profits, but they get yeah, a lot of yeah, public subsidy. Yeah. And if we tr if we shift that away from them to cleaner, the, 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 the system changes yeah. the point that was made there, isn't it? We've got to move away from the older, um, you know, carbon generating industries, as it were, to ones which are um, going to help us help us go towards net zero. But what I'm saying is that the, these companies are part of the answer as well as part of the problem, and we can't just ignore their existence as if they didn't exist. They do exist. They're important players in the field, and we've got to make sure that they're on the side of the angels, and not not on the side of the devils, as it were. Brian's, Brian's trouble with the cost of, of his new heat pump is really because the companies have made gas boilers in such numbers that they're so cheap to produce. Yeah. Yeah. And that needs to happen with the, the new yeah. renewable yeah, absolutely resources. Does. Uh, but you, you can't, you, 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 you get, can't yeah. get at the moment mechanics, as I understand it, to service electrical cars. They're difficult to get. Uh, because they haven't transferred yet the skills into this new developing side of things. Got You've got to make things on that. But, yes, absolutely. That but, but for, for the demand that's coming, that's my point. It's right, not so just current. Just close that off. Yeah. I think that's about the end of our uh, mm -hmm. time. So, uh, <laughs> listen, 
like to thank the panel. And also just thank everybody who's come along tonight. Uh, thank you for your questions and thank you for the patience. Thank you. 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 Thank you.